Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Zoom representation that we're going to host from MNJ. And we are so excited to be having you all joining us today. Uh, we're going to be uh, explaining and going through some SI unit changes that happened last year in 2020. And we're going to have a lot of clarification from the Zimmer guys because they're saying that they are ready to explain everything. So we're going to be listening to a presentation that they're going to be starting shortly. So I'm, I'm really excited that you are here with us and I can see a lot of people are joining us. Welcome you all to our session with Zimra here at MNJ. So I'm going to just ask uh, Mr. Chirangaza. Mr. Chirangaza said. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to leave the time to you so that you you go forth with your presentation and we'll be entertaining questions shortly after. So, Mr. Shirangaza, over to you, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, our viewers from Zoom, Facebook. Uh, my name is Knowledge Shirangaza from Zimbabwe Revenue Authority. I'm a revenue officer. I'm going to be presenting on um, the Finance Act number 10 of 2020. As we all know that uh, the Minister of Finance every year uh, presents the budget. So we are going to be uh, touching on, on some issues with regards to the changes in uh, legislation. So for a start, we're going to look at uh, the Zimra vision, mission, and values. So what's our vision? Our vision is to be a beacon of excellence in the provision of fiscal services and facilitation of trade and travel. Our mission as Zimra is to mobilize revenue and facilitate sustainable compliance with the fiscal laws for the economic development of Zimbabwe. And our values are as follows, integrity, transparency, fairness, commitment, and innovativeness. So like I mentioned earlier on, the Minister of Finance presented the 2021 national budget on the 26th of November last year. And the Finance Act was promulgated on the, on the 31st of December, 2020. So there were some acts that were, that were amended. Uh, we have got the Finance Act, the Income Tax Act, and the Value Added Tax Act. So we're just going to be looking at, uh, at, at these acts, touching base on the employment income, the income from trade and investment, the value added tax and other tax heads. So we start off with uh, employment income, income tax issues. So um, with effect from the 1st of January, 2021, the tax-free threshold was increased from 5,000 RTGS dollars to 10,000 per month for remuneration and in Zimbabwean dollars. What it means is if you are earning less than $10,000, you'll be taxed, but you'll be taxed at 0%. And the highest income earners will be taxed at 40%. So you realize that uh, if you Check our um, tax tables on our website. You realize that uh, on the Zimbabwean tax tables, on the Zim dollar, sorry, tax no problem, tables, no um, if anyone is earning more than 3 million RTGS dollars, you'll be taxed at a flat tax rate of 40%. Then the exempt bonus was also increased from 5,000 RTGS to 25,000. Uh, RTGS effective 1 November 2020. So uh, you, you also realize that the exempt bonus for US dollars then remains at 320 United States dollars. So this did not change. The tax tables for remuneration and in foreign currency were not changed. Uh, you can access our web, uh, our uh, tech tables on uh, www.zimra.co.za. Tech tables for income from employment with effective from 1 January 2021. 
So on your screen right now, if you check, uh, there are some levels of income in Zimbabwe dollars and levels of income in United States dollars. Mm -hmm. So um, if you check the first column there, uh, there's um, up to 120,000 uh, dollars, that's Zim dollars. So if you say 10,000 multiplied by 12, you get 120,000. That's um, the annual uh, income for an individual that will be taxed at 0%. Then for someone who will be earning 840 US dollars per annum, you also be taxed at 0%. Then for someone, if you look at the bottom uh, column, you also realize that if you, you are earning 3 million and above uh, per annum, you will be taxed at 40%, but um, 3 million, uh, sorry, if you are earning up to 3 million, you will be taxed at 35%, but 3 million and above, you will be taxed at 40%. Then if you are also earning um, uh, more than 36,000 United States uh, dollars per annum, you will be taxed at 40% plus. We're moving on to our uh, interest rate on loans to, to employees. Um, if you, if you go to the Income Tax Act and uh, check on uh, Section 8, Section 8 talks about uh, gross income. So uh, if you go now to Section uh, 8.1.F, it talks about benefits. And benefits are, are, are taxable. They form part of uh, employment income. So when an employer grants an employee a loan or a credit, a taxable benefit arises if the interest rate so charged is below the statutory interest rate. Interest rate on loans to employee on Zimbabwean uh, dollar denominated uh, staff loans is now paged at 15% per annum on amounts which exceeds 8,000 RTGS dollars. And the interest rate for United States dollar loans is still paged at 5% plus LIBOR which is London Interbank offer rate on amounts which exceeds 100 United States dollars. We're now moving on to another benefit uh, which forms part of um, section 81F, which is uh, the motoring benefits. Uh, when we are talking about motoring benefits, we look at the engine capacity of the vehicle. We have got the uh, Zim dollar uh, values and the United States dollar values. So uh, looking on your screen right now, you realize that there's up to 1,500 CC. The benefit that arises is 3,600. If an employee is driving a motor vehicle and it has got an engine capacity of up to 1,500 uh, cylinder capacity, the benefit that arises is 3,600 in uh, Zimbabwean dollars. Then, um, that was in 2020, but in 2020, in 2021, it's now $675. Uh, dollars. Then for 1,501 to 2,000 CC, it was 4,820, but now it's uh, $900. Then in uh, 4,000, for, for an engine capacity of uh, 2,001 to, 2000, to 3,000 cylinder capacity, it's now 1,350. Then 3,001 cylinder capacity, uh, it was 9,600 last year, but uh, this year it's now 1,800 RTGS, uh, sorry, United States dollars. Now moving on to monitoring benefits in Zimbabwean dollars. Uh, up to 1,500 CC, it was 54,000 RTGS last year, but it's now, uh, it remained 54,000. Uh, for a motor vehicle between 1,501 cc to 2,000, it remained the same. And I think all the other ones remain the same. So there were no changes to the deemed motoring benefits in Zimbabwean dollars. Let's move on now to the COVID allowance as provided in the 13th schedule. The following amounts paid in foreign currency by the state are excluded from the definition of enumeration. So the COVID-19 civil servants allowance paid as part of the salary or civil service pension or COVID-19 civil servants paid to employees who are not civil servants, e.g. endless of uh, blind persons. 
Therefore, these amounts are not subject to pay as you earn until further notice. If civil servants are currently being paid 75 United States, uh, United States dollars as part of salary and 30 dollars as civil service pension. Moving on now to uh, tax credits in Zimbabwean dollars is amended in, uh, in the Finance Act. Uh, we've got uh, quite a number of uh, tax credits. We've got the elderly person's credit, the blind person's credit, and the mentally and phys uh, physically disabled credit. So for the year ended uh, December 2020, it was 9,000 RTGS dollars. But in 2021, it's now 72,000 RTGS. So what you simply do is, uh, if you are claiming an elderly person's credit, you just divide that uh, 72,000 by 12, then you claim the credit. Now, moving on to tax credits in foreign currents is um, amended in the Finance Act. Uh, the elderly person's credit was 900 last year, United States dollars. Now it's 7,200 United States dollars. The blind person's credit was 900 last year. It's now 7,200. In uh, the mental and physically disabled credit was 900 last year. It's now 7,200 United States dollars. Um, just like uh, on Zimbabwean dollars, if you're claiming uh, uh, any one of these credits, you just divide 7,200 by 12, then you get the monthly credit that you're supposed to create in the employee. We're now moving on to pension commutation, the exempt portion uh, is um, the third schedule, para, paragraph 6H1. So it's paragraph 6H1 is read with the, with the third schedule. So an amount so received by way of commutation of a pension or an annuity that is received by a person who has not attained the age of 55 years before the commencement of the year of assessment to the extent of um, the first 800,000 800, or one third of such amount, whichever is greater, which is paid to an employee on the cessation of his or her employment where his or her employment is seized due to retrenchment. So what it means is when you are, um, uh, when someone is uh, commuted uh, his, his pension, there's an exempt portion that is, is, is allowed by, by uh, paragraph 6H1 is a, a of the third schedule. So if you, if you can allow 800,000 or one third of, um, one third of such amount, whichever is greater. So you calculate a, a one third mm -hmm. and you look at 800,000 and whichever is greater is the one that you allow uh, as, as an exemption. This exemption is applied to a maximum of $3,600,000, uh, uh, which is uh, Zimbabwean dollars. So um, if it's now above uh, 3,600, then the cap is uh, 3,000. Uh, sorry, three million six hundred thousand. We're now moving on to the payment of fees and benefits to non-executive directors, uh, as that is Section ninety-seven C of the Income Tax Act. Uh, there was an amendment there. Uh, all along, the non-executive directors they've been subjected to two types of tax, which was uh, withholding tax and income tax. So the income tax now is fallen away. Uh, they are now are subjected to the final uh, uh, withholding tax, which is 20%. So it says your fees and any amounts of benefits accruing to any non-executive director is now subject to final withholding tax of 20%. So section 97C, which grants the commissioner permission to create the withholding tax against income has been repealed. What it means is uh, non-executive directors, we, we used to, to register with Zimra to obtain a tax clearance. They, 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 they are now subjected to reporting tax of 20% uh, and they can, no long, they, they can no longer register for, for, for income tax. 
Now let's we, we, we have been dealing with uh, employment income. Now we are moving on to uh, trade and investment income. So it says a pay payment of um, certain tax in, uh, in foreign currency as, um, fin as of uh, Finance Act uh, Section 4A. So taxpayer who are trading local and foreign currency are supposed to pay corporate tax in the currency of trade. What it means here is if you receive cows, if you receive cows, we, we need cows here at Zimra, not goats. <laughs> Uh, Arab BZ is retaining and liquidating part of the foreign currency into the local currency at the prevailing foreign exchange auction rate. The income tax legislation does not recognize the effect of the amounts retained and liquidated by the Arab BZ. Therefore, with effect from 1 January 2021, amounts liquidated from foreign currency receipts for local sales shall be declared for tax purposes in Zimbabwean dollars. Then let's move on now to capital allowances uh, section, uh, 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 sorry, of the Finance Act uh, section 4A. Uh, capital allowance are allowed as a deduction in the determination of uh, taxable income. So SI 33 of uh, 2019 re-denominated all balances which were in United States dollars to Zimbabwean dollars on a one-on-one -on -one basis. This revaluation affected many companies that they ended up recording artificial profits because of inflation, which increased their tax liabilities. So what it means is um, if probably um, you had your assets which you bought in the, in the uh, US dollar era, and um, we have been uh, claiming uh, capital allowances in, in US dollars probably up to 2019, and um, now that um, the, 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 the official currency in Zimbabwe is um, Zimbabwean dollars, the reporting currency to be precise, now there's need to re-denominate uh, those balances to convert them to the Zimbabwean dollars. That's the rebasing part we are talking about. So and redeemed capital allowance is at um, 1 January 2021, we'll be rebased to the local currency equivalent of the outstanding foreign currency invest value at the beginning of each financial year. So what it means is if it um, a balance in United States dollars from previous year, it will be rebased to the Zimbabwean dollars, then you can claim them on your uh, financial statements as Zimbabwean dollars. Let's move on now to some changes uh, on BOOT, which is built on operate build on operating transfer and build operating transfer incentives, uh, section 15200. The following expenditure is now an allowable deduction. The amount of any expenditure incurred by a prescribed company under a build operate transfer or build on operate and transfer a public private partnership agreement or projects and related off offsite infrastructure. The company must be for you to claim this um, uh, as a deduction. The company must be, uh, be prescribed for the purpose of uh, 15200 by the Minister of Finance by notice in the government uh, gazette. This is effective 1 January 2021. Uh, what is built on operate and transfer? Uh, by definition, it is a contractual arrangement whereby a counterpart is authorized to finance, construct, maintain, and operate a project, whereby the project is uh, to vest in the counterpart for a specific period. During the operation period, the counterpart will be permitted to charge user levies uh, specified in the agreement in order to recover the investment made in the project. The counterpart is liable to transfer the project to the government or the contracting authority after the expiry of the specified period of operation. Let's move on now to non-resident shareholders tax. Uh, in the ninth schedule, the definition of a dividend is now amended to exclude an amount distributed by the operator of uh, a BOT or a BOOT uh, project approved in terms of the Zimbabwe Investment and Development Agents Act. 
Effectively, such dividends are therefore not subject to non-resident shareholders tax. I think this has been effective uh, as of 1 January 2017. Now we still on our third schedule, para, uh, paragraph 20. Paragraph 20, which exempted receipts and accruals of power generation project from income tax in the first years is repealed from debt of gazetting. So income accruing from power generation projects during the first five years after commencement of operations shall be 0% uh, for the first five years and 15% from the sixth year. The amendment takes effect from uh, 2021 year of assessment. Now we are moving on to the rate of corporate tax um, as amended in the, in the Income Tax Act. Uh, so taxable income from licensed uh, investor after the fifth year of his or the operation as such is 24%. Then um, 14.2G, so I mean the taxable income from company or trust direct from mining operations is now 24%. Then uh, according to section 14.2i, uh, taxable income from industrial fact developer after the fifth year of this or year operation as such is 24%. 14.2j, taxable income from operate of a uh, tourist, tourist facility in approved tourist development zone after the fifth year of this year operation as such, is 24%. This is also effective from 1 January 2021. Now we are moving on to the credits to be deducted from um, the income from uh, trade and investment. Because we all know that uh, all along uh, we had some credits from employment income, which I mentioned earlier on. A elderly uh, person's credit, you mentioned about the physically uh, uh, disabled uh, people's credit uh, and, and other credits that we, we mentioned earlier on. Uh, but um, effective uh, 1 January 2021, there was a credit that was uh, introduced uh, 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 for uh, income from trade and investment. So the current legislation uh, allows credits to be claimed against tax due from individuals and not by companies and trusts. So with effect from 1 January 2020, the Finance Act was amended to provide for claiming of the youth employment credit by companies and trusts. This credit, uh, this credit was then not claimed since the Act barred companies and trusts from claiming any credit. This amendment is meant to permit the claiming of uh, the youth employment credit by companies and trusts. Uh, youth employment credit, um, which a company can claim for each, the youth employment credit, which a company can claim for each individual I had has been increased from uh, 500 uh, Zimbabwean dollars to 1,500 per month up to a maximum of 180,000 per annum. This uh, means that the maximum amount allowable as a credit in any year of assessment is $180,000. So what it means is um, if you've got um, a person uh, aged between 18 and 30 years, uh, which you have employed as a youth, you, you, you can allow um, the youth employment credit when you are uh, uh, doing your financial uh, statements on the financial on the income statement. Then taxation of uh, income deemed to be from a source within uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, this is in accordance uh, with uh, Section uh, 12A of the Income Tax Act. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you realize that uh, the Finance Act uh, number one, I think, of uh, 2019. Uh, was amended to tax uh, e-commerce operators for uh, satellite broadcasting services in, in Zimbabwe. So with effective from 1 January 2019, every person who provides services as a satellite broadcasting service or provides or delivers goods and services as an electronic commerce operators 
operate and receives income, the revenue in excess of 500,000 shall pay tax at the rate of 5% on gross receipts on a quarterly basis as follows. So what we call electronic commerce, commerce operators, uh, we're talking of uh, the Alibabas, the Amazon, and uh, here in Zimbabwe, we've got some people who are developing a software whereby you can just uh, buy your goods and they'll be delivered at your doorstep. So they, they, they are now liable to, to tax. So payment of tax by e-commerce operators, uh, as I said, this is in accordance with uh, Section 12A of the Income Tax Act. Uh, so they will pay their tax as, as, as follows. Um, the first quarter, which is uh, December, January, and February, they will submit a return on the 25th of March. Then the second quarter, which is March, April, and May, they will submit a return on the 25th of June. Then the third quarter, which is uh, June, July, and August, they will submit a return on the 25th of September. Then the fourth quarter, which is uh, September, October, and November, a return will be submitted on the 20th of December. Please take note that um, it's 5% uh, of the gross receipts that you pay as your tax. Now we are moving on uh, from uh, income from trade and investment. We are now moving on to presumptive taxes. This is uh, uh, the 26th schedule is ready with uh, section 22C of the, of the Finance Act. So by definition, um, presumptive tax, uh, this is tax on presumed uh, income. Uh, amounts of uh, presumptive tax have been increased with effect from uh, 1 January 2021. Formal traders uh, uh, to be paid by uh, lessors of uh, premises from which informal traders operate at uh, 2,400 per unit. Um, there is a text, there is a text uh, which has been introduced, I think we'll discuss it uh, in this, um, this section, which is informal traders text. So what it means is um, if you've got um, a property that you are letting out uh, to uh, some tenants or to informal traders who are operating, now there's an informal trade uh, traders tax, which is uh, 30 United States dollars or 2,400 uh, per unit. But uh, this now excludes hairdressing uh, saloons, uh, cottage industry and bottle store operators. Uh, you realize that uh, these yet recent saloon, cottage industry and bottle store operators, they are covered under presumptive tax. We also have got a new presumptive tax for self-employed uh, professional. All this we are going to discuss in detail in the next slide. Informal traders to notify status. Previously, the tenant was supposed to notify the landlord of his or his status as an informal trader for the landlord to have powers to, con uh, to collect informal uh, uh, traders' tax. Landlords were hiding behind the fact that they were not notified. This amendment now compels the landlord, who is the lessor, to collect informal traders' tax from the uh, lessee whether or not there is a notification. The informal traders tax is paid by the source of premises from which the informal traders operate. Landlords will be responsible for the collection of informal traders tax. We are continuing with the informal traders tax. Um, landlords that fail to collect and remit the tax will be subject to a penalty equivalent to the amount of tax uh, payable and interest. Landlords have the responsibility to keep accurate records regarding the number of occupants or operators in respective properties. Landlords shall be required to request lessees to complete uh, Form Rev 5D. This will assist him or her to determine whether one is eligible for informal traders tax. The completed forms must be submitted to the nearest Zimba offices responsible for managing small clients. 
now we move on to the new presumptive tax rates for omnibus operators. Um, for the presumptive tax rates, I want you to notice that uh, they are prescribed or gazetted based on the seating capacity of um, the, the, the motor vehicle. Um, so you realize that uh, for eight to 14 passengers, for eight to 14 passengers, um, it's 2,400, uh, 2,500 per month. Then for seating capacity of um, 15 to 24 passengers, um, is uh, 3,000 RTGS dollars per month per, 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 per motor vehicle. Then 25 uh, to 36 passengers is um, it's 4,000 RTGS per month. Then 37 passengers and above is um, 5,000 uh, RTGS per month per motor vehicle. Then operators of driving school providing tuition and tax cabs. Um, you realize that for tax cab for the carriage of passengers for hire uh, is uh, 2,500 per month per, uh, per cab. Then for driving schools uh, for class four is 30,000 RTGS dollars per month motor vehicle, then class one and two, the same. That's 40,000 RTGS dollars per month. We are moving on now to presumptive tax rates of operators of goods and our vehicles. Now we are talking about those haulage trucks. So the carrying capacity of more than 10 tons, but less than 20 tons. It's uh, 30,000 uh, RTGS per month per motor vehicle. Then for 10 tons or less, but which is driving one or more trailers resulting in a combined carrying capacity of more than 15 tons, but less than 20 tons is 40,000 per month per motor vehicle. Then 20 tons or more, 40,000 um, uh, per month per motor vehicle. Now we move on to presumptive tax rates for the hairdressing salons, the ones that I mentioned earlier on that they don't fall under the informal traders tax, but uh, they, they attract a presumptive tax. So for hairdressing salons, um, the pre presumptive tax rate is 2,500 per chair per month. Then informal cost uh, border traders, it is 10% uh, of the value for jute purposes. Uh, let me just explain a little bit on this informal uh, cross-border traders. Uh, this 10% is charged for those uh, uh, people who, who will not be in possession of a valid tax clearance certificate. So if you are importing goods for commercial purposes and if you are entering Zimbabwe with your consignment and you hold a valid tax clearance, you will be charged 10% of the value uh, of, your, of your consignment is a presumptive tax. But if you hold a valid tax clearance, the 10% uh, presumptive tax for, falls away. Then the restaurants or bottle stores is uh, 10,000 uh, per month. Then cottage industry is 10,000 per month. Uh, we are moving on now to operators of commercial waterborne vessels and fishing rigs. So we, we are talking about now uh, those who will be operating maybe uh, the boats in, in, in some stuff. So if, if, if the boat is not carrying um, um, not more than um, uh, five passengers, it's 10,000 per month per vessel. Uh, five but less than 16 people, uh, passengers, it's 15,000 uh, per month per vessel. Then 16 passengers, but less than 26 passengers is 20,000 per month per vessel. 26 passengers, but less than 50 passengers, 25,000 per month per vessel. Then 50 or more passengers is 30,000 RTGS dollars per month per vessel. 
still on our presumptive text, now we're moving to self-employed professionals. Uh, self-employed employed professionals is an individual who earns income on his or her own account. Um, now we are talking about those uh, engineers, health professionals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The presumptive tax is paid by uh, professionals uh, who would not have submitted income uh, tax returns uh, for the previous year of assessment. Self-employed professionals shall be issued with a tax clearance after payment of a presumptive tax. Once the taxpayer has a tax clearance certificate, he ceases to be a uh, uh, he ceases to be on presumptive uh, tax. The rates are quite substantial to um, encourage uh, professional to submit returns. Please take note of this uh, last uh, power uh, at this point, which says the rates are quite substantial to encourage professionals to submit returns. So self-employed persons, uh, I spoke about um, the architects, the engineers, the legal practitioners, the health professionals, etc., etc. So now um, on your screen, if you check right now, we've got uh, the architects. Uh, presumptive tax per month is uh, 250,000 uh, per month for the architects. Then for engineers is 500,000 per month. Then for legal practitioners is 500,000 per month. Then for health professionals is 500,000 per month. Then real estate agents is 1 million RTGS dollars per month. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've just finished the um, presumptive tax. We are now moving on to intermediated money transfer tax, which is IMTT. Um, the tax, um, the tax free uh, pressure to, um, was increased uh, to 500 RTGS uh, dollars. So if you are transacting any amount which is less than 500, um, you, you won't be charged IMTT. Maximum tax payable is uh, revised to uh, 800,000 on transaction with values exceeding 40 million. So if you are transacting anything above uh, 40 million, um, the flat uh, amount that you'll be charged is 800,000 RTGS dollars. And for United States dollars, the tax free threshold for transaction in foreign currency, um, it remained at $5. Maximum tax payable of uh, 2,000 on transaction with values exceeding 1 million United States dollars. So if you are transacting, Anything above uh, 2,000 US dollars, uh, sorry, anything above 1 million uh, United States dollars, the maximum uh, IMTT that you'll be charged is 2,000 United, uh, United States dollars. This is uh, with effective from 1 January 2021. Uh, still on intermediate uh, money transfer tax. Uh, the following transactions are exempt from IMTT. So there were some uh, 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 transactions that have been exempted from the intermediated money uh, transfer tax. So the transfer of money from a nostro foreign uh, currency account in the name of a person exempted in terms of the Privileges and Immunities Act, uh, that is chapter uh, 303. Then transfer of Zimtev levy chargeable in terms of the main power planning and uh, development act um, that one as well is exempted from uh, IMTT so if you are paying zimtef uh, you won't be charged IMTT now let's ladies and gentlemen we are moving on to value added tax there were some changes uh, in the legislation on uh, value added Tax. Recording of uh, electronic transaction. 
uh, registered operators to interface with our Zimra servers with effect from um, 1 December 2020. Uh, no tax clearance shall be issued to um, those, uh, sorry, no tax clearance certificate shall be issued for, uh, uh, to those who have not interfaced. I'm sure many of you have witnessed that uh, tax clearances are not being issued to uh, clients uh, who have not um, complied with this directive. Similar to audit or registered operators with a view to account for small sales in foreign currents. Zimra to provide public uh, with the 24 hour hotlines to report in and compliance on foreign current transaction. And uh, Zimra to carry out educational awareness campaigns to educate transacting public to demand receipts. So this is uh, more like an educational awareness that we are uh, carrying out right, uh, right now, whereby we are uh, informing our valued clients to say, if you are trading with your customers or clients or your suppliers, you need to ask for receipts in the currents that you have uh, transacted. If you have paid United States dollars and the client is uh, giving you a SIM dollar denominated uh, invoice, you need to raise an alarm to say, um, this is not in compliance with uh, 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 Zimra's requirements for the legislation. And uh, with effect from 1 January 2020, uh, there were some um, changes on value added tax on betting and gaming. Uh, it's now on um, charged at 14.5%. Uh, That's the battery there. Then special rate of value added tax on supply of cellular telecommunication service is now standard rated uh, at 14.5%. Um, effective debt is in this prospect. Um, as you can see, the day it's uh, 1 January 2020. Um, the effective debt is just for meaning uh, to correct the anomaly which was there. So registered operators can only claim refunds if they have refunded their customers. Um, there was also some changes on section 13A of the VAT Act, uh, that is collection of VAT on imported service. So with the effect from uh, 1 January 2021, VAT on imported services was aligned with the payment date for all other registered operators. I'm sure uh, prior to this uh, change, you realize that um, VAT on imported services uh, was uh, submitted on the, on the 10th of the following month, but uh, this payment is now being aligned with uh, any other budget term, uh, which we submit on the 25th of the following Month, uh, which is uh, uh, category C. So the payment is due by the 25th of the following month, following the date of payment or invoice, whichever is earlier. Now let's move on to another amendment on that registration, that section 23.3. So with effective from 1 January 2020, section 23.3, on registration uh, of uh, VAT is amended to permit automatic registration of any person holding a special mining lease in terms of mines and mineral, minerals act. Uh, registration is made in the year in which uh, he or she commenced development of uh, for mining purposes. So uh, if a person is holding a special mining lease in terms of uh, the mines and mineral act, he now qualifies uh, to be registered uh, prior to commencement of uh, trade. Even before they've started operating, they can approach our offices and be registered for, for VAT, um, irregardless uh, whether they've um, garnered any sales or not, they can be registered as per amendment in section 23.3 of uh, the VAT Act. Uh, now let's move on to some amendments, uh, which are also effective on January 
what registration thresholds? Um, ladies and gentlemen, the threshold for VAT has been increased from 1 million, uh, 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 which was last year, for last year, it's now 4.8 million. So this is in accordance with, uh, I think, section 23.1a uh, of the VAT Act, uh, which talks about compulsory registration, uh, then section 23.1b, which talks about uh, voluntary registration. Realize that um, if a person has got potential uh, to be registered for VAT, uh, you apply under section 23.1b, and uh, if a person has exceeded 4.8 uh, million, you can apply for VAT registration under section 23.1a. So the threshold is now 4.8 million. Then for you to be placed in uh, category C, uh, you should have uh, made, made uh, supplies, uh, sales of uh, 19.2 million and above for you to be placed in category C. Any sales between 4.8 million and 19.2 million will be automatically placed in category A or B. Then for instance, uh, Operators in category uh, D, those are biannually, or those ones who are registered uh, on special conditions, uh, their threshold is uh, 9.6 million. Then uh, prescribed amount for the purpose of a refund is 4,800. Pound, which is million dollars. This is effective 1 January 2021. Now let's move on to another text uh, in withholding, um, sorry, VA, uh, value added withholding tax. With effective from 1 January 2021, value added tax withholding tax uh, to be remitted in the currency in which the goods and services consent were purchased. Ladies and gentlemen, take note of this uh, point where we are saying um, when we are submitting our returns, um, if you purchase the goods uh, in United States dollars, now when you are completing your value added tax uh, return on uh, VAT, you need to um, remit in the currency that you have purchased. It's important to note that value added uh, without tax is withheld from payments made to the suppliers by the buyers. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for listening uh, to this presentation. Uh, this marks the end of our presentation. Now I'll hand over to the MNJ team uh, for the question and answer session. Uh, please take note that um, I'm not alone here. I've got uh, Ms. Chikwanda who will be assisting me in the question and answer session. And Mr. Mangwendeza will also be assisting me uh, in the question and answer session. So it's over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chirangaza for, for the knowledgeable presentation that you just gave us. It was quite insightful. And with me here, I got a handful of questions that I would like to ask, and also adding some of the questions that were brought in by our panelists. So if you would allow me on uh, the currency question, we are saying that if we are changing the rates and we have to use uh, the RTGS in Zimbabwe, then the shops are going to be changing their prices, obviously from the, the black market rate, which was around 100, 110, 120, back to the 84, 85, which is changing according to the interbank. So uh, they're going to be increasing their RTGS rates. How are we going to be able to counter such an activity? Uh, I did not get the question. Sorry, can you just repeat? Uh... 
Okay. I was saying that since we are saying that we now have to be using the, the currency and the rate at which the interbank is giving us, most people are saying that the SI unit will increase the prices as it has been shown in some small shops where they are now displaying their RTGS uh, prices using the interbank rate. Mm -hmm. Is there a method that we're going to use in order to counter such effects? Because the rates we they were using were, were black market rates, which were around one hundred dollars. But now they're going to go down to eighty four dollars, which is going to result in an increase in prices. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the exchange rate, uh, we as Zimra, our point of focus is the interbank rate. Whatever we do here at Zimra, when we are converting red lights uh, Zimbabwean dollars to United States dollar, we use the interbank rate. And when we are converting the United States dollars to um, Zimbabwean dollars, we use the interbank rate. So you realize that even when you are doing your pay as you earn returns, um, we use the, 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 the interbank rate. So our point of focus is the, the, the interbank rate. I'm not sure now on um, the, the resultant effect which you are talking about to say, what will be the, in, uh, the, the resulting effect in terms of the increase in prices? That one, I'm not sure uh, on the tax implication with regards to that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm now going to take some questions from our, from our attendees. Uh, there is one here saying, on the youth employment credits, the one you just mentioned during the presentation, how can companies claim this credit like the assessment of qualifying youth. Okay. Um, I mentioned in the presentation that the youth will be between uh, 18 and 30 years of age. So if you employ those youth uh, in, a, in a year of assessment, uh, let's say from January to December uh, 2020, then as you noted in my presentation that uh, that credit was moved from 500 uh, Zimbabwean dollars to 1,500 per youth. So uh, what you simply do is, this is per month, 1,500 per month. So if you've got a, a, a youth, you say 1,500 multiplied by 12, that's for one youth. If you've got 10 youth, you do the same. Then how are you going to action it on the income statement? We all know that uh, credits, we allow them after we have calculated our tax. That's where now we allow the credits. I'm sure I've answered the, 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 the part uh, where the, the client was asking how. Thank you. Okay, uh, and there is another question. It's saying, is Zimra in a position to share a list of international funding agencies or organizations? which are covered under the P&I Act for the IMTT exemption? Um, I think you, uh, that one, uh, I'm not sure on that one. Um, Mr. Mangwendez, I can assist. I'm not sure if he's now in. I'm not sure if Mr. Mangwendez is now in, but he can assist on that one. Okay, currently we only have Mr. Chigwanda in the meeting. Mr. Chigwanda. Um, uh, the IMTT. Uh, currently there's Privileges and Immunities Act, uh, those one are exempted. I'm not sure now uh, if we have got a, a, a schedule of those uh, who are exempted. But if I get to have one, then I will share with the MNJ team, then they will cascade to your client office. But currently, we, we have the Privileges and Immunities Act right. at the ZIMJF level. OK, thank you very much. So William Mufuka, make sure you check on our Facebook page to get your answer. We'll get the answer shortly soon after this webinar. And then there is another another question that is, um, are NGOs required to register for VAT considering that they are not uh, adding value to anything uh, in terms of what they are, their services are providing? Um, for NGOs, we, we take them on case by case basis. But as you realize, uh, most of them, 
they are only registered for pay as you earn withholding tax. They don't account for income tax, NGOs. So if they are now engaged in a business which requires them to register for VAT, yes, they can be registered, but mostly they, they, they don't qualify for VAT registration. I'm sure I've All right, answered thank you very much. the question, yes. Yeah. So do you have uh, some criteria that you use to select NGOs that are supposed to be registered for VAT? Uh, like I rightly mentioned, that uh, most NGOs and non-governmental organizations, they don't qualify to be registered for VAT due to the nature of their operations. But if they are now doing a business which is uh, liable for VAT registration, we can now include them. We can now include them in the net. Uh, let me give an example. We all know that a church is not uh, liable for income tax, right? But if a church is now involved in a business of farming, of maybe owning a, a school, uh, or any other business, probably of sell, selling anointing oil or bengals. This is not in line with their constitution, right? And mm -hmm. they will be liable for, 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 for income tax. You, you, you get what I, what, I, what I say, what I mean. So yes, yes, yes. if an NGO, we know they are, they are business, it's a, charitable, it's a charitable organization, they are not liable for VAT. But if you, if you find out that uh, you are now engaged in a business, that requires you to be registered for VAT, then you have to register for VAT, which is not lying with your operation. Okay, let me give an example. I need to make clarity on this because it seems as the question is now popping up again. Uh, to say, if you are in an NGO business, probably a humanitarian organization, you're a humanitarian organization, you're assisting people, but you have now diverted into a business probably of generating income so that you, you continue your operation probably you are now uh, manufacturing, for example, soap or detergents, but it's under uh, your humanitarian organization, probably as a branch, we can register you for, for, for VAT because it's no longer in line with uh, your humanitarian uh, uh, line of, of business. Thank you. So it might not affect the entire organization, but then the branch where the activity is taking place. Yes, we register that branch, which is uh, 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 into manufacturing. Remember I said you have diverted from your, 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 your operations, but for NGOs, they, they cannot, because their operations are not standard rated. Okay. And then uh, one more question is, uh, let's say you have registered for your VAT and then your business is struggling and we are failing to fiscalize due to financial problems. Our sales are way less than the minimum threshold. Is it possible to deregister VAT for the meantime to be able to get a tax clearance? It is very, it is possible. Um, you can deregister for VAT if uh, uh, your sales are way below the threshold. What you simply do is, you write a letter to the regional manager uh, stating the reasons why you want to be deregistered for VAT and you be responded to and you can be registered. You can be deregistered for, for VAT. So what you do is for maybe, let me just explain further to say, uh, you can attach proof to say, this is my bank statement, and, these are the invoices that I'm raising. I'm no longer uh, meeting the threshold for VAT. I want to be deregistered. I think I've answered the question. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to leave a message to all attendees that all of the other questions that have been that have been written here and not addressed, they will be addressed on our Facebook platform and our website as well. So I'm going to ask one last question, which is coming from William, and it's saying, in NGO, we have a scenario where donors such as EU do not accept VAT, ch VAT charges. So whilst as we pay uh, suppliers, the total price includes VAT, 
How can we claim the VAT we will, pay, we will have paid to our suppliers? Um, I'm sure Mr. Chikwanda can assist me on this one. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chigwanda said. I think Mr. Chigwanda is currently indisposed. Is 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 currently indisposed. Okay. Um. Okay. Let me let me assist the client. Um. If I heard you correctly, you said the client is not registered for VAT. Can you confirm that? Yes. Okay. Yes, as and as... the client is having an NGO. Okay. So if they are not registered for VAT, uh, the law says you cannot claim for VAT if you are not registered for VAT. I think I'm clear. Or I, I'm clear on that one, right? Yes, you are very clear. Right. So you cannot claim a VAT if you are not registered for VAT. That's the first part of call. Uh, then if you are, uh, then, right, then you, you are saying these people are dealing with a European Union, which is outside Zimbabwe, right? Yes. And they, are, they cannot accept someone who is not fat rate right start. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? Because I want to approach it, because... I want to approach it maybe the, the organization NGO is not VAT registered and then they're receiving money from Europe as they a are donation. Receiving money from Europe as a, as a donation, right? Uh, yes. So are they are they are they allowed to take to claim their VAT because their their suppliers they are they're including VAT in the prices? Okay, yeah, like I said uh, earlier on that um, we NGOs will register them on case by case basis. So you realize that in that case, those those um, those can uh, those people can approach us, we register them for VAT, then they can claim refunds. Yeah. Uh, let me maybe clarify a little bit on that one. We have got some development partners, right? So on development partners, uh, of late we've been registering them for VAT. The reason why we've been registering for the development partners for VAT is uh, they have to claim refunds. You, you, you see? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, those are national projects, right? So they have to claim refunds. I don't know if you get okay. now. Like I said, NGOs we register them on case by case basis, not to say all oh, NGOs can be registered for VAT. Like development partners, which you are talking about, uh, they can be they they, they 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 will be registered for VAT and they will claim refunds. They are allowed to to claim refunds. I don't know if I've uh, answered you on that one. Oh yes, you have answered. Okay. So thank, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Zimmer guys, for having us today on our session. Uh, it's already past an hour and we've had a lot of insightful information from you. So Mr. Chinagaza, do you have any last words or some notice that you want to give to our attendees and the, the viewers that we have today before we close this webinar today? Um, I just want to thank everyone who has joined us on this we uh, text webinar. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your inputs and uh, your, I mean, you being here, because without you as our clients, this text webinar would not have been a success. Um, I continue to, we will continue to engage you as our clients to get uh, inputs from you, uh, maybe through MNJ uh, consultants. Uh, we want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, let's continue to pay our taxes, as paying taxes dignifies our nation. We know as, as, as a nation, we are now living on taxes. I just want to thank you all with these uh, few words. Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chitangaza. And I would like to thank all our attendees for having us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.